Okay, so we're, um, this Sunday, we've got the Review Sunday. So things have been coming pretty thick and fast at you. And so what we want to do is take a little bit of time, do a bit of a stock check and encourage each other um, where we're up to. So we'll do that. And then the next two Sundays after this, Daniel's going to be doing some things similar to what we're talking about. Um, and so that would be good to, to get his take on, on some of the things that we're, we're talking about as well. So the same thing I've been talking before. What, what is this all about, the, new, the normal radical? We're called to live our normal lives radically. Our values are as radical today as when we first discovered them. This series is about rediscovering and reapplying those values, and we have permission to deconstruct and reconstruct those expressions. Now, as I mentioned last week, I want to give you an allowance that we do expect a, a lag time between from when these values are presented to you to when we would actually expect you to be living fully in them. It takes time to, to unpack what we really believe and how that's expressed in our lives. And so the way that we look, ab- look at this series, because it's been going quite fast at you, that we brought it to a boiling point and then we're going to leave it to simmer. But while, while food's simmering, it's still reacting and it's still take, taking a different flavor. So over the next little period of time, we're expecting things to be simmering away as God's putting his finger on things and helping us answer the question of what, makes, what would please him and it, find that in our expressions. Now, our plan for today, we're going to have a very lifeline term, secondary illumination. Now, I thought, well, what, what do we actually mean by secondary illumination? It, it's thoughts that have been sparked by what we've been looking at. We're going to have some evidence that the spirit of adventure is taking root. Remember, we started the spirit of adventure back in May. And so we're looking to see what are some of the signs that this stuff is kicking in. Um, And then we're going to have question time with our panel of experts that aren't here yet. Um, And in order to keep it kind of fresh, we're going to do 10 minutes of the... um, taking roots, 15 minutes of the panel, then 10 minutes of taking root, and then the panel again. Um, so let's kick off with the secondary illumination. So the idea, again, secondary illumination, it's spreading ideas. More things are sparking, catching fire as, as we're talking. And that's why it's so important that, that we're talking outside of meetings as well, because that's where a lot of the conversation that brings change will happen. Now, if you, if you were a fly on the wall in some of our community, uh, in conversations that are going on, what are the kind of things that are stirring and mixing with people? So, we, um, Nathan and Avril have had some thoughts on community, and that's something that they've been exploring. And even like old hats like Nathan and, and Avril can still have new thoughts. And so, um, it, it's important that we all engage in this, that we can all be part of plugging new ideas in, into us. And so we thought, well, rather than just having one of them stand up and do a presentation, what they said really sparked was actually when they had their conversation. So we thought, well, let's record their conversation and be a fly on the wall. So they're talking about community. Jacob. And I came across the word of fellowship which in the Greek is not the C word, it's the K word, koinonia. And it's about sharing unity, close association, partnership, participation, communion, intimate bond between Christians. Say those words again. So there's a sharing, close association, partnership, participation, communion. Then it says it's about an intimate bond of fellowship that comes from the cementing of believers through Jesus. So then I'm kind of thinking, well, that is the definition of what this thing we called shared life. This fellowship thing. So my question is, does it matter if you live geographically close? So shared life... Is this word, the definition for shared life? Let's say fellowship, yes. Right, okay. And you're seeing it's different to just relationship? Well, I think it encompasses relationship. And I think it encompasses just the bond that we have because, because of knowing Jesus together. Part of his, you know, we're part of God's family. 
And relationship, I suppose, could be expressed to me meeting up with someone, talking about what's going on, sharing, being vulnerable with them. But the, the fellowship that, that's defined there is more than just that. That's about our lives crossing over. Which is, I suppose I've had you know, experience of doing that when we were involved with the youth more and we'd have young people around. I remember when we were um, doing the house, they'd come to the B&Q with us and um, choose tiles or kitchens or whatever it may be. Um, and that's easier because you know, young people are free and able. But one of the things that I've been considering since we spoke is how do I do that with people that have the same level of commitments as me? People that are now yeah. working yeah. and there's not a lot of spare time. You get back from work. I get back from work in time to help with the kids to get them to bed. Then by 8 o'clock, I'm out doing something. I know, but I think that's, that's the life we've developed. It's, and I, I, I get that. I get the practicalities of it. There's something in that that... I think is the thing that God's putting his hand on has been quite radical that we have to consider. And I don't think, I don't think, so this fellowship thing came up around that time in Acts 2 when the church is just growing and it's talking about the continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. I don't think it means we have to be in each other's house every day or living in a commune, but it does mean we have to, I, the best way I can describe it is overlapping lives. There's also that scripture about having everything in common, isn't there? That's a, that's yeah, a but interestingly, place. I think that's a bit we always pick up in here. Mm. You no know, no one had needs amongst us and all the rest of it. And that can actually make us quite a needs-led focus. Oh, I've got to make sure I meet but the having needs. everything in common isn't just about financial, it's about sharing. Yeah, yeah. Sharing yeah. things, so if I have tools or if yeah. I have time or if I have an ability. Yes. I think so. But also, interestingly, for someone like me on my own, part of the having things in common could actually be children Mm. and connection because Mm. what is meaningful for me is not just a relationship with adults, but a relationship with children because I don't have any. So you, you get to annoy someone else's children? No, I get to love and nurture but what is then helpful for you as a parent is you got somebody who has a relationship with your kids what we've got to be careful we don't get locked into it means more time Mm. because that that's just going to cripple us all it does mean intentional Mm. and i don't think it's about need i think need will come out of it but the focus is not need the focus is connection, communion and mm. and and overlapping lives. And I think that's I think it's easy need feels like the lowest common denominator. But actually I think God's calling us to something where I know you're interested in my life and I am interested in yours. And there will be days when we fight and there'll be days when we get on. If what we're talking about is how we fellowship then it's, mm. it's about obedience. But with that comes a grace yeah. and, a, and a joy. And I think God knows what he's talking about when he tells us to do these things because it enriches the experience. Yeah. It means that my children grow up not just in a community where they go somewhere on a Sunday yeah. and enjoy sparkers, but they grow up with adults that also have an influence yeah. in their life and can yeah. bring a, a not, not a balance to what we do as parents, but uh, another perspective. Mm. I can see some geographic closeness for me in my kind of going home from work thing. I often pop in in the people that I would be connected with just for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour, say hi, debrief, whatever, in the day, hear their day, and then go. If they didn't live geographically close, I wouldn't do that. So for me, there's a relevance in that, but it's not entirely dependent on that. It's the recognition of the importance that actually we can live with all things in common. And if we can, and if we're not doing that now, how how do we make steps to do it? But it's it's well possible. And yeah. as I've gone on, you know, holidays or popped yeah. in on people, it is it is possible. Um, 
it just takes a little bit of a little bit more sacrifice perhaps yeah okay so that's that's a that's a fly on the wall experience of some of the stuff that people amongst us are are chewing over and I mean I found that very interesting just to hear that kind of conversation and think actually though they they get it like more time just if that's all we're talking about that will cripple us and Things like that, and I, I heard the hmm as if we were in a prayer meeting there of people in agreement. But I encourage you, have those conversations with each other because there's revelation that comes there. There's secondary illumination that kicks in outside of meeting times. And let's chew on those meaty questions that we've got. Now, I, I had a little thought, um, and I've used this uh, analogy a couple of times, and I wanted to share that with, with the wider church because I've used it a lot with, with the network when it comes to resources and how we think about our resources. And so I thought that could be useful during this, this review time. So imagine you've got your little container and you've got that much resource, whether it's time, energy, or money, and you know, actually, you need much more than you've already got. And so we start off with doing what we normally do. We, we put it at the bottom of the pipe and we hope to get filled. And so take, for instance, let, let's in this scenario think it, it's a, it, the need is money. So I would automatically think, well, that's going to come from my salary. But there are other channels that God has put into my life. There might be supply that comes from friends and family. It might be about me choosing to cut costs. It could be money falling from the sky. Um, that's happened. Um, it could be forgetting other needs, and it could be about enterprise and other kinds of income. The key thing is, who is my source? Do I look at my salary as my source, and if I have no salary, then I have no provision? Or do I see God as my source? And God might use these different channels. And so the, the challenge that I've felt at times, thinking through, what am I dependent on? Okay, well, if, if, if I lose my job, then I'm screwed. But that's relying on my job as my source and not relying on God as my source. And recognizing that God can use different channels, any channel he, use, he wants, because he's creative. So in that situation, our key question is, okay, God, I look to you for everything that I need. I need to now recognize you might be using a different channel, and I've got to get my bucket under the right channel to get what I need. And so I just want to encourage you, when talking about uh, the, the resources that we need in our lives, that God is the source of every res- everything that we need to resource us. But we just got to be thinking and wisely and challenging each other, what is the source that you're, what is the channel that you're looking to for that? And secondly, when talking about money, we've got to know, um, and again resources, was that money given to us as bread for consumption of ourselves, or was it given as seed for the planting and the investment for others? There's a story by um, a woman called Joyce Mayer that she talks about having this red dress. And she, she, the, she put this red dress in her wardrobe, and she never got to wear it. And she kept on thinking about this red dress, like, oh, when am I going to wear that? And w- one day she was praying for one of her friends and thinking, God, what can I do for this friend? And she looked up, and she saw this red dress hanging in her wardrobe. And she said, oh, no, it, I've not even worn it yet. I can't, I can't pass it on yet. And then she pushed it down. And then she had another, um, another moment of praying for this person, and the red dress came up into her mind. And she realized that that red dress was seed. That was never bread. That red dress was giving to her so she could give it on. And recognizing the importance and the opportunity and the joy of being able to be a channel in that way. My dad tells a story of being at a conference where, an, where a man got up and he said, um, with all of the need and the suffering in the world, how can I be wearing a 15,000 pound watch? And so there was a lot of, I've got a 15,000 pound watch. And his answer was, because my father gave it to me. It had a different meaning. It wasn't to be seed, it was to be bread in that setting. And we can live our lives feeling guilty about the bread that we've been given Just in the same way, my father gave me that watch. He gave it to me, for me. It wasn't something to be passed on. My last little picture here. This is Jonathan and his armor bearer deciding if they're going to... Well, Jonathan's suggesting, let's go up and 
have a go at these uncircumcised fellows. Um, I'm sure he was English in that way. And the armor bearer says, yes, let, let, let's give it a go. Let's see if God's, God's up for it. But I love Jonathan's position because he says, God can, God can save us or God can make us victorious with many or with few. And so you've got a whole army of Israelites sitting there doing nothing. Jonathan and his armor bearer said, let's give it a crack. The two of them go up and destroy a whole garrison of Philistines. And there was an understanding of God is the source of victory. God is the, God is the one that I look to. It's not in the size of my army that I'm going to see the victory. It's not the size of my bank balance that makes me think that I can, I can be victorious. It's not the amount of energy that I've managed to conserve that's going to make me successful. It's not the amount of time that I've built into my diary that, that's going to make me successful. God can save by many or by few. With I've, if I've got two pounds or two thousand pounds, God is the one that saves. If I've got three minutes or seven days, it's I trust in God and what he's able to do. So there we go. That's just a couple of thoughts that we wanted to chuck to you um, when we had this kind of break in the series. Now, where have you guys seen signs of the spirit of adventure taking root? Now, I put an email out to the group leaders, and so I asked them, tell me some of the stories that you've got. And so um, I also want you guys to be part of the exercise. So I'm going to give you a minute to think for yourself where have you seen the spirit of adventure taking place in this community? And that's dating back to May. And we were talking about May, what you've got to have to be part of a spirit of adventure. You've got to have an attitude of risk. You've got to have an attitude of cost. And then recently we've talked about money. We've talked about serving. We've talked about crowns, all those kind of things. So start the minute timer. Think of yours and then text someone else in the room and say, oh, this one's yours. Meanwhile, I would like um, Margaret Ackerman, Sally Jones, Jill Harvey, and Martin Smith to come up here. We won't have time to hear everyone's story today. Use the Facebook group as a way of sharing. Call Lorraine, share with Lorraine. These things, it's about our testimonies bring breakthrough in other people's lives. So if you ever get tempted to think, oh, it's just a it looks like I'm just bigging myself up, or it looks, that was only significant for me in that situation. That's the enemy trying to clamp down on celebrating what God's up to amongst us. Just as we used it in the, in the prayer meeting on Tuesday, we use other t- people's testimonies to give us hope of what God can do in our lives. Don't let the enemy silence you. You have to be sharing what he's doing. Okay, so, um, Margaret. The challenge is for everyone that's going to come up here, you've got to be under two minutes. Okay? So, Margaret, tell us a sign of the spirit of adventure taking place in this community. Um, One day, David was out in the front garden and our neighbour came out and she's always got something really wrong with her. Um, So David offered to pray for her. She's a Sikh lady. Um, And uh, so he prayed for her. Um, We don't yet know what happened with that, but he took a chance. Excellent. Okay. Very good. Good time. Well done. Well done. <laughs> that, uh, no, don't clap. We've not got time for clapping. Clapping later. But that, that, again, that, that's stepping out, doing something risky. Jill. Um, yeah, it came from a discussion um, that we had in house group about um, the finances and the tithing. Um, as the, the the discussion progressed, I kind of felt a challenge because I knew that I knew that my heart wasn't right in it. I hadn't really been kind of tithing with any sort of form of diligence or kind of you know it all been very haphazard. Um, so during the discussion, I just confessed it to the group really, and um, I asked them to hold me to account on it. And by that, I mean um, actually confront me with the question have you tithed this month have you uh, you know um, ask about wages um, other income are you doing what you said you will do excellent again there's I believe Jill is, is going to see amazing breakthroughs in her life in different ways because not because God wants her money but as we put things in order God empowers us to live surrendered lives Mark 
I'm going to use some of Margaret's time as well. So, um, <clears throat> as some of you know, we've had a really great extension bill, and um, part of what we felt, or mainly what we felt, it would enable us to um, entertain people. You know, reg not me and Deb doing a double, you know, song and dance type thing, but uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but actually, you know, <laughs> hospitality type. Um, and so we've done that, and also an offshoot of that is we've also created a, a space now for youth to hang out as well. So we've got these two things. But at the same time, uh, my, uh, my contract finished uh, with Lifeline, and Jamie's image was great because my bucket has now shifted to one of the other channels of expecting God to do things, um, either through my photography um, or through other things. And as you know, as you know, we felt that because we wanted to do the hospitality stuff, which can cost money, we didn't want to be restricted on that. So we were expecting God to help us with that, along with everything else that we're doing. Excellent. Great. Sally. Um, many, many years ago, um, when I was in my mid-twenties, I went to Nepal and lived there for three years. And as part of the job there, you had to learn to s speak, read and write Nepali. There's another long testimony, a lot of threads of Nepal through my life. But in a nutshell, in the summer, or just, be just before the summer, probably in June or July, Rachel suddenly said to me, oh, Sally, you know that link with Nepal? There are a lot of Nepalese ladies now coming into the hub, going to sewing classes, going to English classes, maybe eight, nine or ten. So I was like, oh, well, I need to go and meet them. So that was easy, you know. I looked forward to that, off I went to meet them. Then um, really felt God say to me, I went along, met them, had a great time. Felt God say, you know, you need this much. Well, I wanted it to be more, more than that, but also God speaking about it. So I invited them for lunch with Ra um, Rachel and Ginny and Julia came too because they knew them from the sewing class. But it was really scary because I'd said, open my big mouth and said, oh, I'll cook Nepali food for you. <laughs> yes, you know, <laughs> which I never did in Nepal. And this is a long time ago. Um, and on the morning, I was really scared. I was really shaking. While I was making it, I was like, you must be completely crazy doing this. But anyway, they I made the food. It didn't burn. They came. Um, and we just had a really lovely time. You know, they went out in the garden, looked at the chickens. All that. It was lovely. We were blessed, and they were blessed, we could tell, you know. And, um, but then following on from that, in the summer, they had the... Actually, I haven't got too much time. But to cut it, to cut it short, they were at the hub, and one of the ladies was, was healed. Um, which somebody else gave testimony about. But then we felt in September, well, we were praying over the summer, um, and one of the ladies actually had texted Julia after she came to the house for lunch, and she said that was so wonderful because, I can't, I can't remember her words, but it was something like, I've never, to be invited to an English person's home. And the way it was written, it was like this was clearly so unusual, which shocked me dreadfully because she she'd been here eight years. It was really sad. Um, and then we decided in the September, we felt God say to start about, no, following on, Sally did a survey following on from the week at the hub. And one of the questions on it was for the, anybody who's going to the hub, would you like to learn more about Jesus in a small group? And all eight or nine ladies said yes. In amongst all of this is the week at the hub and one of the ladies was here. But they're all of, they're of other faith. They're Hindus slash Buddhists or a mixture or a different faith backgrounds. So Rachel um, pushed on and said, yes, we, well, we need to do the a Bible study. So we invited them all, and again, all eight or nine said they'd come. And again, we were like, well, what are we going to do? You know, blah, blah. God sent Sylvia amongst us, who doesn't speak Nepali, but her fantastic background of you know, working amongst people of other faiths, cultures. So Sylvia, Rachel, and myself met and prayed, and in great trepidation, the ladies came. And now we, we watch a film in Nepali. We read the script in Nepali. We read it in English. And... It's really scary, and I think all three of us would say we're way out of our depth. You absolutely, you don't know what's going to happen, where the conversation is going to go, but God is clearly moving, and it, it is absolutely awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> so, that's just a quick grasp of some of the things that God's already doing amongst us. And some of those things, that they've just been unearthed because God is stirring with us. So we don't pick topics to look at because we think that would be fun. It's because God's warning us and saying, get ready, I'm taking you on an adventure. And I love that. For, for Sally, it was unearthing something that had been buried in her for a long time. And I think, wonder what God's doing that amongst us 
things that we've learned. We've learned languages that suddenly become valuable or not learned how to cook that becomes valuable as well. <laughs> okay, right, we'll hear some more later. Now I'd like my panel to, to come up, please. Oh, that's Nathan, uh, Phil, Avril and Elspeth. Now if you remember last week, you gave us, or you text me lots of questions... Um, how many singletons does it take to change a light bulb? Got rejected. That has not made it through. Um, but some of them did. Um, I will be, uh, will be, hopefully this week, uploading onto the website all of the questions that you've asked so far. We've got 87 questions, um, and we're going to try and, make, try and create a platform for each of those things to, to be looked at and discussed so you can, be, you can continue to participate. But just like Nathan and Avril are having conversations, don't wait for someone else to come up with a solution. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. God's given you a role to, to find an answer to what we're looking at. Okay, so our first questions are around serving, and this one goes to Avril. So responding to need. If you see a need but aren't asked, do you still serve? And B, do you have to specifically hear God, or can you just get on with it? <laughs> um, first of all, if you see a need, then I would say you've seen a need, so therefore you have to do something about it. But that doesn't mean you have to fulfill the need. So a lot of these questions, I've kind of come at it from what do I do, what do I think, what does God can impress on me? And then obviously that's just law, really. No. But I think for me, when I see a need, I really have to ask God, is it mine to fulfill or not? And to be honest, I don't, you know, I don't wait for a big blinding light in the sky. You kind of know, don't you? Sometimes, though, I can't, or it's not mine, or it doesn't feel like it should be me that responds, but I've still seen a need. So I've got to do something about it. So what I do is I nudge somebody else. No. <laughs> And I don't mean it, and I really don't mean it in a sense of I'm passing the buck, because actually it might be Nathan's, or it might be Phil's, and, and I find, or, <laughs> or else, but it's really interesting because sometimes, some people see things and some people don't. Nathan doesn't see things. <laughs> and that's okay, because we all have different gifts. But actually, I know some people would be more than happy and actually look forward to doing something, but they just didn't see it. So I think it's, it's always my responsibility because I've seen it, but how I respond to it is different. And what was the second part of that? Uh, oh, so, do you have to, do you specifically have to hear God? You know, hearing God is not a magical thing. God promises that because we're his, we're his children, we'll hear his voice. It's not magical. You don't have to pray for hours. As you walk with God and as you choose to communion with him, you will know. Okay. Um, People were saying you should serve with your heart in it, but if it's sacrifice, won't that make me a bit miserable? (laughs) Elspeth. I really wish there was a different answer to the one that I've got here. (laughs) But I think the heart of serving is love. And um, serving is an instruction, not an option. And fortunately, it's not really very dependent on how I feel. So when I was thinking about some examples, um, I did go to the ultimate example of Jesus on the cross. And um, if you remember, when he was on the cross, he he said, um, let this cup pass from me, yet uh, not my will but yours, Lord. So I'm kind of thinking that when Jesus was on the cross, he was probably he's probably more than a little bit miserable in that sense of he didn't really want to do that. But he came at it from the heart of love for us and he was willing to serve us in that way. So serving does include sacrifice and it does sometimes include pain. Um, but fortunately... It does also include grace, that ever-present strength in time of need. So I know that there's been times where I have been serving and I haven't particularly enjoyed it, but somehow as you kind of lay your life down um, for others and there's that sense of love for others in it, there is something else that rises rises up to take that place of feeling a bit, bit miserable. And I think the other point was 
um, in our culture, we tend to want that instant gratification thing. So we always want to enjoy what we're doing, like now. But actually, uh, if you think about it, I think it's in Hebrews where Jesus says, um, for the joy set, or that it says, for the joy set before him, Jesus laid down his life. So it's like that delayed, actually, that delayed gratification is more the kingdom culture. Excellent. Okay. Um, saying no to serving opportunities has been lots of questions around that. So um, is it really okay to say no? Then how do you, how do you respond to someone bringing a correction? Um, how do we avoid judging others' motivation to serving or not serving? How much serving must you do before you have official license to turn down other opportunities? How, how, to reckon, how do you recognise when a particular serving action needs to stop? Okay, so that's for Nathan. Snappy, isn't it? I've got to answer all of that. Yes, is that right? Is an answer? I won't give it to hands. Right, um, so saying no to serving opportunity, is it really okay to say no? I think it is. <laughs> Make it come back. Um, but then I think the next part, if then someone challenges you on it, I think, I think we're not an island. We don't know all the answers ourselves. And so it's very much about how we work in community, how we benefit from the church, from each other. And so that can be good and difficult at the same time because if I don't think I've got all the answers, then you have some answers for me, perhaps, or you know, any of you. So that means if you say something to me, I can't just dismiss it. There has to be a way, apart from you. What you say has to be immediately dismissed because you're walking around nudging everyone with blooming elbows. Um, watch out for her elbows. But I think, so in terms of how would I respond if someone brings a correction, I think my job is to hear the correction and consider it, and then sometimes I might talk to those around me, my friends or, you know, those people that I don't like. Um, how did you know I was looking at you? <laughs> um, to say, what do you think of this? Or, you know, those that I'm accountable to. And so then I won't make a decision on my own, but I will share that with those around me. I have to get a sense of settling in it, but I will use those other people to, to help me get that. Um, how do we avoid judging others' motivation to serve stroke not serving depending on what day you catch me on I'll have a different view on judging um, because actually we do have a responsibility to judge and it says so in that book um, but we have to judge each other we have, we have to guide and help each other and some people use judging as a very negative word and so oh no you mustn't ever judge anyone I don't really use it as a negative word I think it's about helping correct someone, suggesting a different approach. Um, so I think if someone says, oh, no, I can't possibly do that, I think sometimes if we don't help them see a different way around that, then we, are robbed, we rob them of the opportunity of serving. And actually, the person that I think gets blessed most from serving is the person that serves. So I wouldn't want anyone to, to, to escape from that opportunity to bless themselves. That's where my... my my helping them becomes actually a responsibility, not just to show them a serving opportunity, but actually encourage them towards it and encourage them to think about it. How much serving must you do before you've got an official license? I think it's 10 years and three months. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it is a hard thing, isn't it? So um, there's, uh, there's not a, a clear amount there, but I think some things, some things aren't fun to do and we have to keep on going back and getting the grace to do them and see when God gives us a release. Again, we're not an island, so working with those around us, that's about relating with people, having open lives. How do I recognize when a particular serving action needs to stop? Is that my two minutes? Am I timed up? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it's the same as the others. It's about getting that sense, talking it with others, um, it's not really about the need, but it's about what God's given you to fulfill. So kind of, maybe it's time for you to you know, do an Avril and nudge someone else for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, over to Phil. Can someone serve too much or too little? What is our opportunity slash responsibility to such people? Yeah, I think they can. 
job done. <laughs> I think what you need to have a think about is what's the motive behind the serving or not serving. So if you're serving a lot to create a sense of identity, uh, this is who I, I do, this fulfills a need in me, it makes me feel really, really useful, um, that could potentially lead to difficulties. Um, so I think we'd have to watch that. I think there could sometimes be an over-reliance on your own strengths and gifting. So you know, if you're that type of person who's good at that type of serving, you might just start automatically assuming you're the one to do it. And I think that is something to watch out for. Um, and on the flip side, I think if you're saying no because you're trying to protect yourself, um, then that's probably not the right thing because we should have an opportunity to work through on the trust front and say, okay, God, this is going to require something of me, but I trust that you're going to supply my needs um, and you're not going to stretch me beyond what I can take. So, um, yeah, I think it, there, there could be if, if you're trying to, to operate from a sense of self-protection. I think one interesting one I've chatted through with people is sometimes people not serving because they're actually deep down, when you press beyond the surface... Um, there's a fear that their serving might not be good enough. So actually, they don't want to do it because it might go wrong or they might look funny in front of other people or it's not going to be as good at, as when that person's done it. And I think we have to be really, really watchful of that because it's not our, our role, really, to question that. I think our role is to be obedient to what we feel God's saying, us, uh, saying to us. Yeah. Good. Okay, moving on to money. I assume that the people sent out from the church, e.g. Teaching Doulos International and the like, not teams, were funded from the church coffers, i.e. tithing and offering. Is this in fact the case, Avril? It's been an interesting one. We felt um, last year that it was time to start sending people again. And the Doulos International opportunities came up in Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone now, we've always had a, a, a basis that when we send someone to do something, we pay for it because that feels right. But kind of this time, we kind of thought, but actually, there are some people that we want to train from here in this whole thing, and that's going to be an awful lot of money if we pay for everybody. So we've done it interestingly this year, which is again one of these opportunities for people to exercise faith. So as a community, we have to exercise faith for the money to send people. But some of the people who go on the do loss trips pay for themselves. And that feels quite exciting because it's a wee bit like a mini team. So some people, and we have a, a kind of lead trainer who we would pay for, and the others we say, okay, here's an opportunity for you to be trained, to see God provide for you. And that's been quite a big deal for some of the folk, but it's really quite exciting. So... There's never a rule. Our, our basis principle is if we send, you know, we'd pay. But actually, interestingly, we're doing it a wee bit differently this year. And it's quite exciting to see how people are providing. God's providing for people. Okay. Elspeth, is it okay to have savings when others cannot pay their bills? Uh, I refer back to Jamie's little <laughs> enlightenment earlier on. And also some of the stuff that Avril was talking about um, from Acts. So the basis is that everything that we have comes from God whether you're in a time of abundance or in a time of not abundance it all comes from God and it all belongs to him and God's promise to us is that he will provide but as you saw from Jamie's channels there isn't like a therefore if you've got lots of savings you must be the one to make the provision over here it's about hearing from God um, and hearing what he's saying to you whether you're the one in abundance or the one in lack actually e either way there isn't like a rule it's it's not like that it's, it's not a, a rule to cover it all so um avril mentioned about the passage in acts when all the believers had everything in common um but presumably there was a sense of vulnerability you have to know if there's a need so there has to be a vulnerability um within that relationship to be able to know whether there's a need and then in that story in, in acts there was um a personal decision made by each one before God according to their ability as to what they were going to give. Um, and do you remember Judy's story from a, two or three weeks ago where she asked someone if they would lend her some money and they said no? 
And the reason they said no was because actually at that moment it was about sorting her finances out. So I kind of think there isn't a, a straightforward answer. And sometimes we can get in God's way if we act out of that human um, kind of compassion, for want of a better way of putting it. If we just dole the money out automatically, you kind of get in the way sometimes of what God's doing for someone. Excellent. Okay, my panel, you can have a few minutes break. Could I have Jane, Shatui, um, Sue, Sylvia, and Gwyn? Okay, so more signs of the spirit of adventure taking root. Sue, tell us something that's going on in your group. Okay. Um, this is a story about Susan Haywood stepping out on a spirit of adventure and sharing it with me. Um, about two years ago, uh, a lady wandered in the meeting here who should have been at the Albanian meeting there, but she liked it and she stayed. And she came to lunch a few times with us, so she came a bit. And then um, she has a difficult life. Uh, she was from Albania, um, but lived most of her life in Italy um, and just had a daughter here. And then her daughter went to Canada this summer with her boyfriend and left her all alone. So she couldn't afford to stay in London, so she moved to Birmingham because she knew a friend of a friend of a friend. So basically nobody in Birmingham. And she had some business to finish off in London, so she contacted Susan and said, could I come and stay? And I've really seen Susan change a lot this year. And Susan just went out on a limb, risked it and with a bit of an adventure and said, OK, come and stay. I've got a couple of nights free. You can come and stay. So she did. But Susan was telling us about this and we thought, well, how can we stand with Susan and support her to do this? So it turned out that the best way for us was to, for me to go and have dinner with Susan and the lady on Wednesday night. So I did that and I found that, first of all, Susan had been really stepping out and just telling her all about God and praying with her and just, you know, giving it to her between the eyes, basically, about God, rather than to um, see the thing as depressing and lonely and isolated and disastrous and horrible. And Susan had been really faithful to her in that. And as we quickly got chatting, I realised that... Um, some of the work that I did with Creative English in the last couple of years has meant that it's taken me to Birmingham and I've made a number of connections there with people. And so I did a lot of Googling and a lot of texting uh, and realised that there were two good connections that I could give of, of Christian organisations where they were warm and welcoming and offered um, job advice, English help, um, volunteering opportunities. And so we were able to give all of that to her um, we don't know what she's going to do with it because that's between her and God and the rest of it. But it was very exciting adventure to see Susan stepping out on that. Excellent. So, so again, we're seeing... Uh, the actual stories are great, but what I'm particularly excited about is what's going on in us and also our opportunity to gather around those that respond in faith. And I think that's, that's the spirit of adventure taking root. Okay, Jane. Um, this came from the, I think it was the first workshop that we did as house groups. So we were talking, and at the end, um, David Newman said, okay, so if Jesus says, give to everyone who asks, then what would that look like for us? Are we, are we willing to do it? And it was like, oh, that's a big question, okay. So, um, you know, people said yes. and then, the, But then the next day, the text came through on our our house group whatsapp and said so who's up for it and then these thumbs up kept coming up from people and I was I was at work and I thought yes yeah, so I put my thumbs up I was just about to send it and then I thought actually this is quite a big deal <laughs> so don't do this lightly you know are you really going to do this so it did, I did start to laugh and I thought okay god I'm trusting you with this and I sent it and then went away and did something came back and three minutes later there was a message saying oh, you know, uh, people are needed for the nutshell, in a nutshell, to write it. And your name came to mind, sir. And I was like, okay, all right. Then. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so God, God's in it with us. Great. <laughs> okay, again, another example of stepping out. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, I think what I write was about my neighbours, wasn't it? <laughs> um, I've had a number of new neighbours recently in different points in Hayden Road. And I've decided to, I've done that before actually to other neighbours, given them information about the hub, um, but also this time to invite them to pop round for a cup of tea or coffee or whatever. Now I've got definite days off 
how I can offer them. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sylvia. Um, well, in our development group, um, we were trying, one day we were trying to do something together and we wanted to do an outing and it just wasn't working. So they are, either the day was wrong or the activity was wrong. And then out of nowhere, it seemed, um, somebody mentioned, well, you know, there is so-and-so in the church that really needs help with gardening. And suddenly it just felt right. And that's what we ended up doing. And it was amazing because a lot of us could make it. And we had a great time. And the garden was done, which would have been a huge task for one person. But when we got all together, it was perfectly fine and it was great. And it really helped us because it made us feel we achieved something good. We've done something good for someone. Excellent. The, the other reports I heard from that, that group is lots of opportunities to challenge and encourage and support each other as the group has stepped out saying, what can we do? So, again, great signs. Thank you very much for everyone. Panoy, you can come back up again. And we have a money question. When do we say no to lending? Funny enough, I'm going to give that to Nathan. <laughs> Always. <laughs> um, so I think the, the principle that we'd have in church um, is that we won't want to encourage people to get into debt. We want to encourage them to manage the resources that they have. So that would be, if someone came to me asking for some money, that would be my first approach is, well, yes, I can help you. Let's look at what you've got and look at how you can use that. Um, what was the question? How do we, when to say no to someone? So I'll, then occasionally I might, depending on the situation, I might, but generally I'd want to help more holistically than just the, the money situation. Okay. Phil, is it okay that I feel a loss when I give? Yeah, I, th I, th I think that's okay. Um, if giving is sacrificial, then there probably is an element of, yeah, wrestling with the fact that you're, might have, you might have given something away that you were hoping to use for something else. I think that's the reality of it. I don't think that that's wrong. Um, if you go back to Christ's example, I think when he sacrificed, there was an element of, oh God, this is quite difficult. And I'm, I'm sure the father was having a bit of a hard time with that as well. But um, I think the expectation is also that as we, um, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So if you take that principle as well, then you would expect that God can meet you in that and that you wouldn't stay in a place of, um, loss and actually that that could become um, as God meets you a sense of real joy so yeah I think it would be okay it's part of the tension of working out the fact of our human nature and things like that but we'd, we'd expect God to meet us in that and, and take us forward okay moving on to community life is it okay not to go to socials if you don't feel part of the group Nathan um, <laughs> the group is just like a what, what, I'm assuming the question is like a development group or a house right, group, okay. I think. Is it okay? So what, you're not invited? I'm imagining they are invited. Right, okay. But, but and, and they want to go. Is that okay? If only right. I'd given them to you right. beforehand. Is it okay to go to socials? <laughs> well, I just know that there's, there's stuff, 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 stuff. There you go. <laughs> Right. It's just the way I found it difficult to grasp the way it's written. It's like as if you don't know if you're allowed to go. So it's perhaps you don't want to go is the thing because you don't feel part. Well, um, I think the way that you would get to feel part is by going, by putting yourself out, by recognizing that actually it's important to relate with people and sometimes that's not about your preference. I think what you could do, do is probably say to someone, um, that you relate with, I'm struggling with this, and, and perhaps you've got a confidence issue of walking into the room or, or whatever it is, and they can help you with that. Um, but I think if we just vote with our feet, if we just decide what we do as an individual without bringing others into that, then we're not really in community. We're not really benefiting from what we believe in in relation to church. So I think to, to open that up and to do what we don't necessarily like to do, but recognizing the value that's behind that. Okay, another community life question. When you have a busy job, how do you get to meetings? I thought, Phil, you have a busy job. What's your answer? And I don't like meetings. 
Well, I think after about half an hour is normally my limit, isn't it? I start causing trouble after that. Um, yeah, I, I struggle with this one, actually, on, and I have struggled with it. So I think a year, a bit more than a year ago, I, I wasn't really going to development group, was I? Um, and I kind of felt that was just too much um, because work was really, really intense. I was getting back late. I felt like that was what God had for me to do. Like the, I knew the work thing was part of my outwork in of faith. But I did have to review that because I noticed as a result of that, I was feeling l less connected to people and um, I wasn't aware of things going on and that didn't feel right either. Um, so I really had to weigh that one up and I've made a commitment to go um, since a little while ago. They call me church at home, Phil. But yeah, I, I've really enjoyed being part of the group actually and I think um, the step for me is that actually it's not about the time, it's about trusting that God has a way and me giving up that time isn't necessarily going to mean that I can't get the work done. It's going to be um, if, if God has a different way. It's like, again, that source, the bucket source, it doesn't have to be money. God has other ways of getting things done and enabling us. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a real deal, though. It is a real deal. Um, so I guess what am I coming to? I'm coming to a place of it shouldn't be the arbiter. The business shouldn't be the arbiter. We should be um, having a, a place of faith that if God wants us to be part of something and be connected and there's a real benefit and he c calls us to be together and meet together, um, then, then you know, we should, we should listen to his nudge on that. But actually, I think there could be times when it's okay to say no. Okay, this is an all play. Um, if you have only budgeted for one family holiday, would it be okay to prioritise a family holiday over a church holiday? Anyone can answer. I've got the microphone, so I'll, I'll kick off. Um, I think it would be. I think, I think you could see time with your family as really important, but I wouldn't want you not to think about time with your wider family as also important. So... If I was talking to someone about this, whether it be you know, someone else or my wife, um, that, that's the thing I want to consider. How, what do we benefit from the church holiday, in, you know, the holiday with the wider family, and what do we offer to that? And we've got to get a sense of weighing that, because there might be times we think, actually, it's really important where, where the kids are at the moment that we need to take some time with them. But that could be done within that wider context, and maybe that's not my preference, but... There, there could be a, a benefit of that and actually a sense of conviction for that. So I don't think there's a formula in it. Um, but I think, again, it, I'd want to weigh it and consider it and chat with those around and see how others are, uh, are handling that, that decision. And I think with me for that, when, when I want to see how others are weighing that decision, the people that I'll go to is the people that... Um, How would I say this? The good people. Like, you know, you, there's people that you think they're probably, you know, they're quite solid. And there's people that you can think, well, you know, they're, they're quite free. And it's about weighing up what, what sources that I choose to listen to. And I think that's quite an important thing about what voices, because you can always find someone that says what you want them to say. But actually, I want, I want to be talking to people that are really chasing after God. Okay. All right, we've got a few miscellaneous ones here. Um, so, if we say that perceived walls need to be overcome with scripture and testimony, this is referring back again to the uh, Tuesday prayer meeting, is it okay to have 10 minutes teaching without a single reference to the scripture and say that reference will be given in the notes? I thought the notes were a synopsis, not an extension of Sunday's teaching. I'll look up the Bible verse references and compare it to what's been said with everyone else. Avril. <laughs> yes and no. Yes, there are times, and it, it was interesting with Anthony's teaching last week, he, he said at the end, this is based on biblical basis, but the, the different scriptures that I've used will be in the nutshell. That was, he specifically said that. And I think... That was completely appropriate for what he was wanting to communicate and where he was going with that thing last week. I think at the same time, we've got to be careful we don't end up spoon-feeding people with principles and not where does it come from. 
So I don't think it's about having the, the reference there, because I don't think that changes anything. What I want us to be is a community that journeys together and understands what it means to read the Bible and to understand it and to have it as part of the food that God gives us. But if we just get into, then therefore every talk must have that, that's the way to do it. That's just nonsense as well. Our basis in our connection with each other should be to lead each other further to Jesus. And that is also sometimes even some of the things Elspeth said. Where does it say that? What is it? How does it say that? But let's not get into some nonsense about unless the Bible is preached every Sunday, we are not, we are not pursuing God because that's just stupid as well. Okay, last one, Avril. Uh, sorry, Elspeth. Is it okay that children have to endure so much pressure doing GCSEs, A levels, and uni degrees? It's one that's quite close to my heart. This one. Uh, so I have two children. For those who don't know, one's just gone through A-levels in his first year at uni and one is um, in the final year of GCSEs. And I think uh, for us as parents, it's been a question of keeping the, va- the balance between the kingdom values and the values just that are just cultural values. So um, schools really value very high grades and there's nothing wrong in valuing high grades except when it's, uh, it's coming at, a, at it from um, a perspective of, you, you know, you must get straight A's in everything, otherwise you've, you've failed kind of thing. Because actually, when you, when you look at what God has given us and what God requires from us, it's more about diligence and hard work and pursuing through the things that, that God has, who God has made you to be and the natural skills and abilities. So... Um, you know, there, there may be some things in that, pe- that, that are taught in schools that are very, very highly valued, like science is quite highly valued in schools, but it's not the only thing in life. There's, it might be that, that God has created you to be a fantastic artist or a fantastic uh, writer or you're going to be the person who, um, you know, does this amazing dance or, you know, it's not just about the arts, obviously, that's just me. But, uh, <laughs> or you might, you might be an ele- Thank you, Avril. You might be an amazing electrician or plumber, and those things are just as valuable. So I think the encouragement is, um, as parents to our children, you know, work hard, do your best, be diligent in studying and with what God has given you, rather than the pressure on the grades, which is what tends to come from schools. I'm kind of not looking at Phil here because he's a a teacher. (laughs) Um... So work hard and be pleased, then you can be really pleased with the grades that you get. And uni is not the only choice as well. That's, that's one of the choices. There are many, many different options that you can choose from. Phil, would you like to make a comment on that as a teacher? Certainly. Uh, <laughs> no, I totally agree. I think you're responsible for the diligence and the hard work and then you give the rest to God and the outcome isn't something for you to worry about because I think if you're doing what you're responsible for, You can trust that God gives you the increase in it. I've had lots of children in various settings stressed out about exams. I've had some Christians saying, sir, sir, pray for for me. I'm about to do this exam. And I said, I'm not going to pray for you. You should have done your work. (laughs) You know, know, because, you know, it's a sense of, well, that's God, you know, God works in us different things. He could be working the character. He could be working, you know, I don't think we have to worry about the grade thing. God will have a a pathway for us regardless of whether we get an E or a a U or an A. The important thing is that we're doing what God's given us to do. Um, So I I, I completely get that diligence thing. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. And even that, the picture of the um, channel and, and source, we can make the source of our success our exam results. But if God is the source of our success, he might use exams and those things, or he might use something completely different. He could take us in a different route. Um, just one of the things that I notice of having the benefit of seeing all of the questions, there's just two things that I just want to warn us about as a, as a community. And it may just have been, been wording and things like that, but let us be careful that whenever we, we talk about community life, we don't fixate on meetings. Because 
we, we had that question there, like, well, I'm busy, how can I always get to meetings? If we're living our lives just centred around meetings, we've kind of lost what God's called us to be. And so let, let us remember that we're called to be more than meetings. Um, the second thing is that I'm, I'm looking at with some of the questions is there's not this machine called Lifeline Church that is churning through answers. There's not like a bunch of people sat in a room that are thinking, oh, how are we going to make things this way or that way or whatever. A lot of what we've stepped out to do as a community has been when an individual has been prompted by God, they've stepped out in faith and people have gathered around them to support that. So um, I think uh, Sue gave a good example of Susan. She, she responded in faith and the, the group said, how do we support a person in this? That's how we have Open Doors. That's how we have LCP. A lot of things are about individuals responding to what God's saying rather than what's, what's the church going to do about this? So we can ask those questions, but remember, you are as much part of the answer as the person asking the question. Uh, so I want to encourage you with that, and we will be looking at that over the next little while. I want us to be... I want out of this series our DNA to change, and we are people that say... I'm part of the solution, I'm part of the answer, because God has put something in me that means I can be part of it. Um, I want to just give us the opportunity to uh, respond to what the same things that I put up last week when we were talking about serving, because when I was, when I was preparing, I felt God's still saying that there's something in, in this for us. And so I keep coming back to this terminology that God empowers us to live surrendered lives Once we make the decision, put first the kingdom of God, all things are added to us. He empowers us to live how he's called us to live. And when it comes to serving, those empowered lives operate in this way. That we serve sacrificially and not conveniently. That we can see how to love those around us. That we are moved by compassion and not out of guilt or process. That we are wise to respond appropriately to needs and that we have the ability to reveal the Father's heart through our serving. Now, if you're looking at these and thinking, you know what, I want my serving to be more sacrificial. I want to be able to see those around me and how to love them in an appropriate way. And it might be not just responding to needs. I want to be compassionate, not process-driven. I want to be wise, because sometimes I I think I respond soulishly to, to needs. And I want people to see, not me, and not how good I do, but I want them to actually see a father that loves them, and that that would bring a power to to unlock and set people free. So if those are things that you want to respond to, or if any other other thing that you want to come up for prayer, there'd be the opportunity to come and pray at the front, but otherwise we are...